Ideal Protein is a doctor-designed, coach-led, ketogenic weight loss protocol that uses food as medicine to empower you to lose weight and live your healthiest life. And welcome back to the Livingston Parish News Weekly Show, a podcast brought to you by the Livingston Parish News. This is Around Livingston. We just recorded with Rob, who's from the Cheap Seats. Now we are with Mr. David Gray. I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, but if you'll remember, and we're going to be reminding folks about this, we've split up. We're not doing group therapy anymore. Rob's going to have his own show. David's going to have his own show. So, sir, go ahead. Introduce yourself. Hey, this is David Gray, news writer with the Livingston Parish News. So today, plenty to talk about as we, uh, even though we are sort of in the doldrums of summer, uh, mostly school stuff too, which is kind of surprising. Uh, but first and foremost, at a recent school board meeting, uh, Superintendent Joe Murphy uh, had a lot to say about school safety, especially in the wake of the uh, Uvalde shooting in Texas. Uh, so give us give us a little bit of a rundown on some of the things he talked about. Yeah, this has been a topic that a lot of parents have had question, you know, concerns about since since that happened in, uh, I believe May is that when it was? Yeah, uh, uh, several weeks ago, and and so he just wanted to let parents know that they're uh, that, that the system is, you know, looking into it right now. There are thirteen school resource officers in the district. Not one of them has more than five. Now, if you remember last year, the school board approved hiring three more because before there was 10, and that was really a problem on the uh, on the east side of the parish because uh, I believe at that time there was one that manned the Albany and Springfield schools, and if you're familiar with that area, I mean, those schools, you know, that's a fifth, can be a 15-minute drive from each other depending on where you're going and or, you know, how bad traffic is. And, you know, ev- in those situations, every minute counts. So. So they were able to hire three more and put one over there on that side. So now none have more than uh, than five, I, I believe, is what he said. But, you know, the district is also looking at other other safeguards. I know that they're working with the share. They they uh, he talked about some of the mock drills that they do. They've had four full scale mock drills uh, in the past few years just to kind of, you know, just to better prepare faculty for that situation during professional development days this year schools will have the option of being able to take part in more of those kind of drills just to uh just to better prepare prepare themselves and mr murphy said that they're also looking for uh they're looking to apply for a grant that would allow more safety measures to come in such as visitor software and uh upgrading the physical security uh at the school so yeah it's just just ways to make the school system more safe and you know he one of his things was you can't prevent every tragedy from happening but you know you do everything that you can to prepare for it and that's what they're doing and uh it's good to see that you know he said they didn't want to you don't want to wait around for something to happen before you before you make changes that you know they're actively doing this they've partnered with crime stoppers i know that that has uh, that has worked in the past where they've had some lockdowns of schools. Uh, I know last year, I believe it was Live Oak Junior High that they had uh, that uh, they got a tip through Crime Stoppers that went to the Lipset Parish Sheriff's Office. And they were able to close down, uh, lock down Live Oak Junior High for you know a few hours just to check it out. You know, it ended up being nothing serious, but you know at the same time you have to take those take those situations seriously. And uh, I know Walker High had an incident last year where they. Had uh, they found a mess, you know, I know some of those messages Walker High did them high, they found on bathroom walls and they have to investigate those. So it's just just them making making those extra efforts just to ensure that, you know, there's 26,000 students in the school system, another 4,000 employees. So you got 30,000 people in those schools every day and you just have to make them as safe as possible to prevent, you know, stuff like that from happening here. I'm sure. And, it, you know. A lot of people don't like to hear uh, that you can't you can't avoid every tragedy tragedy, but it is important to note that sometimes you you know uh, you do your best to protect against it. So, uh, other news in school news, but this one more of more good news. Yeah, uh, school lunches are going to continue to be covered. Tell us about that. Yeah, this is under the community eligibility provision program. This is uh, the school system has been a part of this since after the flood. So. Uh, after since 2016 and basically this is a federal program that a that allows that allows uh accepted school systems to it, it, it covers the charges for breakfast and lunch for accepted school systems like i said the livingston parish has been a part of this since after the flood and uh miss 
Summer Purvis, uh, the director of the food, food service system, I think she said this comes out to about six hundred and fifty dollars a year for for families, and you know, especially with the price of uh, prices of everything going up. I mean, it might even be more than that, honestly, if you're talking about breakfast and lunch every day for for a student. So, uh, so yeah, that that was more good news uh, that. Uh, families are looking for and again there's you know 26,000 students in the school system in K through 12 and uh, this you know this is just one less expense that families have to worry about when you have expenses for a whole bunch of other things this is just this takes away one one headache for families sure and uh, yeah I mean there, there's a consistent expense for lunch and you know, it, it, it continues to be covered, and I, I, I know some families personally where this has helped them tremendously. So uh, going to be interesting to see how much longer it continues, uh, but good to see it's continued for another year. Um, <clears throat> getting back to a subject that we haven't talked about yeah. in a while, <laughs> uh, COVID. Yeah. Um, thankfully, you know, uh, this is still, these are mostly still Omicron variants or the, the or, sub variants. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it continues to be all sorts of variants and sub variants. Um, but haven't, haven't quite gotten to the, the hospitalization levels of the past or anything like that, but it no. is, it is, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to, I think the department of health is trying to spread awareness, uh, because it is still out there. So tell us a little bit about the recent statistics and comments from, uh, Louisiana department of health. Yeah, the Department of Health had a uh, had a press briefing last week. Uh, I was actually to talk about the the, the con- confirmation of the first case of monkeypox in the state, and then they wanted to give a uh, a brief update on COVID. But if you've looked at the numbers, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people may have forgotten about the numbers or that COVID was a thing, uh, but it is still here. The last the last several uh, not several, but last few weeks, there has been a been a noticeable increase in cases. I think last Thursday there was 5,400 and uh, yesterday, Monday, there was 5,600, I believe. So new cases, excuse me. So, and uh, Dr. Joe Canner, the state health health officer, he meant, he talked about this and percent positivity has gone up to above 20% in the most recent reporting period. So that's one out of every five tests coming back positive for COVID-19. And a few weeks before that, it was at 14%. Uh, so it, it just keeps going up. Actually, no, it's 23%, so almost one in every four. Uh, so, But he did point out that this appears to be less harmful than previous strains. If you, don't, if you remember, in January, I believe we reached over 3,000 hospitalizations at one time. As of uh, this week, we're at 600. We've been around 600 the last few days. So even though we're seeing this huge spike in cases, it still hasn't uh, gotten to the level of to of overwhelming the state's hospitals, which is the main metric that they look at when, you know, you're talking about, uh, I know this is a uh, word people don't want to hear, restrictions and stuff like that. But that's the main metric they look at is hospitalization, how the hospital is being able to handle this. And right now, the they're fine. And when you look at when you look at even though there's about five between five or six hundred hospitalizations, there's a small percentage of those people who are using mechanical ventilators, which is another thing that has uh, one of the other metrics that they look at. So, as of right now, people aren't getting sick. Uh, Dr. Canner pointed to you know a few reasons. He said ninety percent of ninety five percent of the state is either vaccinated, had COVID in the past, or both. So people's immune systems are. Uh, better uh, equipped to handle COVID should they get it. But yeah, I mean, a lot of people are getting it right now. And I know that's having some effects in other areas, but we'll just, that's just something we'll just have to keep an eye on moving forward. I mean, hopefully, you know, he said this is the sixth surge. Uh, we'll wait to see whenever the, when it, when the cases peak, we, it doesn't look like they've peaked yet, but you know, so hopefully that would happen soon. And then you start going down and seeing those cases go back to where they were and, late March, early, uh, you know, early April when, I mean, we got to historic lows in cases reported a day. I mean, you know, a few, a couple hundred a day. I can't remember the the numbers, but I mean, it was very low numbers, uh, the lowest that we've had since March of 2020. So, so yeah, hopefully we'll get to that day soon. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. 
So moving over to uh, more community-based news. Uh, we're National gonna, news. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess <laughs> it is. Uh, so some of you out there may think that you can dance, but uh, for specific individuals, there is a show where they get to test their skills. Uh, tell us a little bit about, I believe her her name is Raylan Johnson. Raylan Johnson. She is. Uh, this is a story that was not in the paper this week, but it will be uh in the pay uh, or excuse me online today wednesday june 13th or july 13th before the next episode of so you think you dance premieres well yes raylan johnson's 18 year old from walker she graduated from walker high on may 21st and she was in los angeles for her nationally televised audition on may 23rd so two days after graduation she was in los angeles getting ready to do the biggest uh, performance of her life, but this is a uh, th- she's been she's been an early fan favorite. She's yeah, I had never watched So You Think You Dance before in my life, so this is the first time I've been watching this show, and uh, and she she has impressed the three judges every week. She's actually one of the only dancers who they they the show follows a format where they have a bot or four dancers in danger. So at the end of all the performances. The judges announced the four dancers in danger, and then they announced the two dancers that will not be moving forward. She has not been in that bottom four yet, which shows that she has impressed the judges so much that they haven't even considered her in danger yet. But she uh, she has a very interesting story. Her family uh, has been living with their grandparents since August because their home got wrecked by Hurricane Ida. Uh, the, her dad, Jamar Johnson, I spoke with him and his mother recently, and he said they felt like the storm passed right over their house. Uh, just the, the winds were howling that night. It ripped off some of the shingles in the roof, and then the and then the rain. Since you know there was nothing stopping it, the rain was falling in their house. The ceiling collapsed above their living room, and basically it has been unlivable for the last yeah you know, eleven months now. We're getting closing on eleven months since Hurricane Ida. So Ray Lynn was living, her and her uh, parents and her younger sister, they were living in their grandparents' house during her whole senior year. She was doing that while balancing school, track and field practice, and dance. And I mean, dance is, for people who aren't familiar with uh, dance, uh, uh, dance uh, student dancers, I mean, that's a big commitment. I mean, that, you know, easily 15 to 20 hours a week and that's on you know that's on top of your regular student duties you know being a student being a kid and you know that's also you know something that's a sacrifice from the family because the family has to bring you back and forth to those uh to those practices uh competitions all of that so but she still was able to you know she still stayed dedicated to to dance despite all that she was her and her family was going through after hurricane Ida. You know, in one of her in her audition episode on the show, she you know said dance is the one thing that has always kind of helped her escape from reality. You know, she was doing this interview with with the film crew sitting in a gutted house with bare sheetrock, and you know, just talking about dance and being a thing that allowed her to escape. And you know, I can imagine this last year she's needed to escape plenty, just kind of dear because I believe her grandparents live next door to her so you know you have that constant reminder that dang I don't have a home right now so I mean it was uh I think that mo all that all that was seen uh after her audition she ran backstage and you know she's hugging her parents and they're all sort of crying and you know they didn't have words her mother's like you know her mother said I have no words I'm just a proud mama right now and her dad said it was tears of joy and you know when I spoke with him he said seeing her you know with all the television cameras watching her all the people cheering her on knowing that however many people are watching back at home to see her you know put all the stuff that they the family was going through aside and to still get out there and give a heck of a performance that you know that all the these professional judges these professional dancers who for them to be blown away by her i mean it it just made them proud so we're going to be following Ray Lynn through the rest of this uh, journey. We'll see how long it goes. Tonight is the top eight episode. Uh, she performed twice in the top 12 because they actually didn't eliminate anybody after the first top 12 performance. They used, uh, they they saved two people. So she's made it through top 12, top 10, and now she's on top eight. And uh, if she survives tonight, she'll be in the top six next week. So we'll be following this the rest of the way. <laughs> 
Right, so keep an eye uh, on our website, www.livingstonparishnews.com, and of course there will be write-ups in the paper on her. Uh, so why don't you introduce yourself, sir? Uh, this is David Gray, news writer with the Livingston Parish News. And my name is McHugh David, publisher and editor of the news. Appreciate you guys joining us for uh, This Is Around Livingston. It's the single show we do with Mr. David Gray, and we also have From the Cheap Seats with Mr. Rob DeArmond, where we talk about sports. Please remember the news is on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube. We are once a week in print on Thursdays at $7 a month. Get that in your mailbox. We're also online, www.livingstonparishnews.com. Appreciate you guys out there joining us, and we'll see you next time.